Our Bibles are open to the Gospel of John, the 13th chapter, as we're continuing to walk our way through this fourth Gospel record, presented under the title, I Believe. John writes so that we might believe the right things about Jesus, and through that repentant, believing faith in Him, could find the wonderful gift of eternal life. Today, we're in John chapter 13, verse 36, and I'm going to read down through the first verse of chapter 14 in a message that I've entitled, Don't Say what Simon says. Don't say what Simon says. John chapter 13 beginning in verse 36. If you would be able and willing to do so let us stand to our feet to honor the reading of God's word. Listen to the word of your God. John 13 beginning in verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, that is to Jesus, Lord where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go you cannot follow me now but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the reading of your perfect word. Thank you for the movement of the Holy Ghost from heaven to come and stir our hearts and to prepare us to receive the preaching of your perfect word. And I pray the Holy Spirit that has been moving from the beginning of this service, from the very first note, would now draw our attention to the risen Christ. And if there are any here that are lost without Jesus, at the end of this service, may they cast themselves upon your only begotten Son. May those that are estranged from you, your children that are distant from you, be drawn back through the preaching of the gospel fresh and new. Draw us again to the cross and the empty tomb of your son Jesus. And may Christ be glorified in this service, in this message, and all that flows from it. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We all make mistakes. Some are minor, some are major. And we've lived long enough to know that you are not exempt from blowing it just because you're a child of God. I said just because you know you're born again does not mean that you're immunized from spiritual failure. When we fall and fail the Lord, sometimes it's very secret. It's private. Nobody knows about it but us and God. Sometimes a few others might be aware of it. The pastor, a close friend, a spouse, or a family member. Sometimes the failure is known to the community. Sometimes it's in the paper. Sometimes it's on social media. And everybody in our larger sphere of influence knows what we have done. Every once in a while, the entire nation knows about it. I'll mention the names Jimmy Swaggart, Jim Baker, Ted Haggard. But I don't know of all those that have ever failed the Lord, and that's every one of his children, I... Do not know if there's one that is any more broadly known than the one that we're going to investigate and study today. It's the case of denial of the Lord Jesus Christ by the disciple named Simon, also called Peter. I'll remind you where we are in the story of the life of Jesus. We're in the dark hours of the Thursday night just prior to his crucifixion. The cross of Calvary is casting a long shadow across the face of the Lord. The Last Supper has been served. They are about to leave the upper room. After a little teaching from Jesus, they will go to the Garden of Gethsemane where an agonizing prayer will be offered, a kiss of betrayal will be planted, an arrest will be made, and a night of injustice and a mockery of trials will be ignited. Within just a few hours of these events, Jesus will be crucified on the hill called Calvary, laid in a borrowed tomb. I submit that if there was ever a time that Jesus needed a true friend, it was now. If there was ever a time in his earthly life and existence that Jesus needed someone who would stand by his side and have his back, it was now. And yet, surrounded by a mob of spiritually dead religious zealots, Simon not only does not defend the Lord, he actually denies that he even knows And as the words of denial 
flow from the lips of Simon Peter. I want to caution you this morning about some things we need in our lives if we're going to avoid saying what Simon said. Now from these verses of Scripture as well as some selected verses from the other gospel records, I want to show you three things about this issue of spiritual failure and spiritual denial. First of all, I want us to consider the factors in this denial. Simon Peter's denial of Jesus is really a textbook case of spiritual failure. We need to examine the reasons behind this infamous act because it will teach us some things about how we can avoid spiritual compromise and failure in our own lives. What I'm saying at the beginning of the message is this. What Simon Peter did is a recipe for spiritual failure. And if you and I allow these things into our lives, we'll fare no better than did he. Let's examine these things and see what we can learn. First, I want you to consider a stunning arrogance. A stunning arrogance. Someone has noted that there are two apostles in this chapter that are predicted to fail. Judas will fail because he did not think enough of Jesus... Simon will fail because he thought too much of himself. Jesus has just declared, I'm going away and none of you can go with me. And rather than submitting to the teaching of the master, Simon puts his big old 13E shoe right back in his mouth. You would have thought he might have learned. When Jesus spoke of the cross and Simon Peter said... God forbid that should happen to you. And Jesus had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. You would have thought he might have learned on the Mount of Transfiguration when Simon Peter said, oh, let's build three tabernacles, Jesus, one for you and one for Moses and Elijah, presumably because y'all are all on the same level. You would have thought he would have learned just a few moments before this text when Jesus was going around in the garb of a servant with The basin filled with water and Simon says, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus had to rebuke him and say, if I don't wash your feet, you'll have no part of me. You would have thought that Simon Peter would have learned by now that he needed to put his brain in gear before he put his mouth in motion. But he is a very slow learner. Jesus said, I'm going away and you can't come with me. And Simon Peter begins to do what is the hallmark characteristic of all who will stray from the Lord. He begins to argue with the Word of God and argue with the God of the Word. Why can't I go with you? I'm going with you. I'm going to follow you now. In fact, Jesus, I would lay down my life for you. Can you imagine anything any more absurd in the shadow of the cross (laughs) Simon thinks that the the unveiling of this night's event is about him dying for Jesus. Could anything be more backward, inside out, upside down, convoluted than that? But Simon Peter is full of himself. Perhaps he had not paid attention in Sabbath school when the writings of Solomon were the text for the day. For in Proverbs 11 verse 2, the Bible says, When pride comes, then comes shame. Pride opens the door and shame comes in when pride props the door open. Proverbs 6.17 says that a proud look is an abomination to God. Proverbs 16 verse 18 declares that pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. Paul affirms this truth in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. What Paul said to the Corinthians, what Simon learned the hard way, is what I'm trying to teach you today. The person who says, I'm not going to fail the Lord, you may be next. The one who says, I love my wife too much, you may be next. I love my children so much, I could never. You may be a candidate for failure. The Bible warns us, if you think you can stand, you better take heed. You're going to fall. Then I think about King Uzziah from the pages of the Old Testament. He was a warrior king. And the Bible says in 2 Chronicles that when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corrupt. Pride causes an athletic team to think they don't have to practice for the game. 
Pride causes a husband to think that he can get too close to a woman in the workplace. Pride causes a woman to think that she can get too close to a male co-worker. Pride causes the alcoholic to think, I can handle just one drink. Pride causes the teenager to say, I can handle just this one look. Pride causes the Christian to think, I'm so close to God, I can do without Bible reading today. I can do without prayer today. I don't have to be in Sunday school. Not a strong, devout Christian like me. Lord, I will never. Jesus said, not only will you not never, you're going to do what you don't think you'll do before the sun rises tomorrow. Pride. Here's a stunning arrogance. But there's another factor we see in Simon Peter's life. And that is a shocking apathy. Think about everything that has happened in the events of John chapter 13. The feet have been washed. The betrayer has been confronted. The last supper has been served. And Jesus says to Simon Peter very bluntly, Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny that you even know me. I want to ask you a question, Emmanuel. Was there ever a better time for Simon Peter to be on his toes? To be watching? Was there ever a better time for him to be vigilant? Was there ever a better time for him to be on his A game? And yet we find out that as some of the most historic events of all of human history are about to unfold, Simon Peter goes to sleep. We learn from the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke that after this encounter, Jesus continued his teaching and then his disciples went with him to the garden called Gethsemane. All the remaining eleven went, but Jesus called three, Peter, James, and John, a little deeper into the recesses of Gethsemane's garden. And he told them in Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 37, he told them to watch and pray. And the Bible says after he prayed, he came and found them sleeping. And said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. Simon, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Simon, just a few moments ago, you said you would never fail, never falter. Simon, Peter, I don't think you were lying when you said that. I believe you meant it. I don't think you were trying to overly impress me. I don't think you were trying to pull one over on me. I know your spirit is willing. But Simon, there's another problem. Your spirit may be willing, but your flesh is weak. He says, sit up straight and pay attention, son. Temptation is all around you. And if you're asleep at the wheel spiritually and asleep in the garden, literally trouble's going to come on you and you're going to go down like a rock. Are we not living in dark days ourselves? Do we not live in a day that we need to be spiritually attentive? More than 70% of our own state lost without Christ. I say it's time to wake up. In recent days, the Supreme Court has sanctioned same-sex marriage all across this country, which I believe lit the fuse to the dynamite that is going to destroy the foundation of this nation. I say it's time to... Get the sleep out of your eyes and wake up. Our children are bombarded by sexual predators and pornography is flowing into our homes through Wi-Fi and satellite television and the cell phone. I say it's time for the church of the living God to awake from their sleep. Ephesians 5 and verse 14 says, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. But you see, if you're so full of yourself, if I get so full of myself that I say I will never, if I think that I'm above failure, just makes sense to take the afternoon off. A little siesta, a little nap, a little break from the things of God. And when that happens, we'll see the third factor in this denial. Not only a Stunning arrogance and a shocking apathy, but there's a surprising attack. 
Simon Peter did not have any idea how close he was to spiritual failure. But before the rooster crowed, he denied that he knew the Lord. With the recent terror attacks by ISIS in places like Paris, we've been reminded of a lesson we should have learned on September the 11th, 2001. And that is, vigilance has to be ready all the time. The adversary only has to be ready one time. I'll remind you that this same apostle would later say in 1 Peter chapter 5 that Satan is like a roaring lion roaming around seeking someone to devour. I think he might have said that not only by divine inspiration but by painful personal experience. As Jesus is arrested and taken into the courtyard of Caiaphas, they would spit upon him and mock him smite him and scoff at him and someone said to Simon Peter aren't you with him? who? me? talking to me? oh no 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 I'm not with him a little bit later someone says I recognize your accent you're not from around here that, that's a Galilean accent are, are you sure you're not with the carpenter from Galilee? Look, I'm telling you, I don't know the man. I don't know how much plainer to say it. And then just before the rooster crows, a slave girl says, you were with him. And he curses and says, I don't know the man. Think about how quickly this has happened. One minute I will die for you. The next minute I don't even know the man. One minute in Gethsemane's garden, he unsheathes his sword and lops off the ear of one of the arresting guards. Moments later, he's he's laid bare by a servant girl asking a simple question. What are the factors here? Simply put, if, if you and I get filled with spiritual pride and think that we're above failure, And we take a season off in our relationship with Christ. It will not be long at the time of the devil's choosing. The trap will be sprung. The door will close. And you or I, we will go down. Those are the factors. I read the story recently of a building in a downtown area that was set for implosion. On the day of the implosion, five engineers went into that building to do their final inspection. You know what an implosion is. They they put dynamite in the building, blow it up, and when it detonates, the building collapses on itself. Well, part of the preparation is they go in and they weaken supporting walls. These five engineers were not aware that the building had been fatally weakened prior to the detonation. When these five men walked across one of the upper floors, the combined weight, probably no more than about a thousand pounds, caused the building to collapse. Four of them were killed, the fifth was critically injured. My point today is this, everything about your life from the exterior may look wonderful. You may even have yourself fooled. But if you have filled your heart and your life with spiritual pride, If you have begun to take a break in your relationship with Christ, I'm telling you today that the dynamite has been placed, the walls have been weakened, and at the moment you least expect it, one little bit of weight, one little act of pressure, and your life may come crumbling down. These are the factors. Second thing I want us to consider as we just think about this Occasion in Simon Peter's life, not only the factors in the denial, but the fallout from the denial. Recently on a Sunday night, I preached a message called Three Reasons I Don't Want to Sin. And one of those reasons was very simple, that I don't want to suffer the consequences. (laughs) That may not sound very noble, but as I told you that Sunday evening, that may not be the best reason, but it's not a bad reason either. I don't want to suffer the consequences. Simon Peter experienced fallout in his life because of his denial of the Lord. The first one we find from the other Gospels is distance from the Savior. As Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and taken 
to the first of his many trials that night. The Bible says in Mark chapter 14 and verse 45 that Peter followed him at a distance. I believe that's more than a geographical footnote. I believe there's spiritual typology in that statement. Peter is still following him, but at a distance. Notice the relationship is not severed, but the relationship sure is strained. He's not been cut off from Christ. Thanks be to God, that can't happen for a true child of God. But I'm telling you, there can be a breach in that sweet fellowship. And Peter is following at a distance. Oh, there was a day not many days prior to this, if you had asked Peter, what do you think about Jesus? He said, I believe he's the Christ, the Son of the living God. There was a time that he would have said, I will follow you forever. There was a time he would have said, I will die for you. And now he won't even speak for Christ, much less die for Christ. Still following, but at a distance. You see, when you get away from the Lord and when you fail Him, let me tell you what often happens. I see it all the time. People begin to distance themselves from the Lord. Understand, Christ is not the one that moved. But we begin to distance ourselves. Maybe it's embarrassment. Maybe it's shame. Perhaps it's regret. Maybe it's demonic condemnation. Perhaps it's... A Holy Ghost conviction that we're not processing and responding to rightly. But when some Christian falls and fails in their relationship to Christ, one of the first things that happens, you'll see them stop coming to church. They'll quit coming to their Sunday school class. They, 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 they get out of fellowship with God and with God's people. And God's not the one that's moved. Still following. But at a distance. There's distance from the Savior. Simon Peter experienced something else, and that is discomfort from the Spirit. You see, God has not wired one of His children to where we cannot sin. God has not even wired us to where we cannot sin and enjoy it. But God has wired His children to where you can't sin and enjoy it for very long. And the Scripture says over in the other Gospels, Mark 14, 72, says that Peter went out and wept. Following his betrayal of Christ, he wept. Matthew 26, 75 says he went out and wept bitterly. The Greek word describing his bitter weeping means to be pierced with a sharp and violent point. These are not crocodile tears. These aren't glassy eyes. The word Matthew uses would... Give us indication that Simon Peter is so overcome with regret and genuine deep-seated repentance that he is convulsively weeping over what he has done. I propose this morning that's the fate of every genuine child of God that gets away from the Lord. I believe I want to say that again. That's the, that's the hallmark of every genuine child of God that gets away from the Lord. The most miserable person in southeast Georgia today is not the lost man. He's spiritually dead and unaffected by spiritual matters at all. The most miserable person in southeast Georgia today is the child of God away from God being chastened by the Spirit of God. And if there is that chastening within your heart, I want you to know... That's one of God's paternity tests, saying you're one of mine and the ones that I love I'm going to chase and I urge you by the mercies of God, respond to it today. Simon experienced distance from the Savior. Discomfort from the Spirit. He also encountered disgust from his sin. A a, a moment ago, if you caught it, I said that Simon repented with genuine, deep-seated, sincere repentance. You say, well, how do you know? Well, you can't tell if all you have are his tears. I said, you can't tell if all you have are his tears. We've we've seen crocodile tears at the altar before, haven't we? You say, boy, he came forward and really got right with God. Well, he may have. Boy, she came forward this morning and really got right with God, didn't she? Well, she might have 
I submit that if all you have is the kneeling at the altar and the tear-stained carpet, that, that's really all you know. You know how you tell when someone has genuinely, really repented? They change. We understand that Simon genuinely repented because he never denied the Lord again. In fact, God would go on to use him in great and powerful, mighty ways. If you and I get away from the Lord and fail and fall in our fellowship with Him, we can experience distance from the Savior, discomfort from the Spirit, and for the child of God, we will end up absolutely in deep regret over what we've done. I want to end this message with good news. Not only the factors in the denial and the fallout from the denial, but the forgiveness for the denial. You see, for every Christian in the building this morning, that's good news. Because we have all, in some way, great or small, denied our master, either in word, thought, or deed. And therefore, the conclusion of this story is gracious good news. Here's why. Even though Simon Peter put his brain in neutral and his foot in his mouth, his restoration was not going to be based upon what he said about Jesus, but what Jesus had said about him. Simon's restoration was not based upon Simon, it was based upon Christ. John wants us to know this story is really not about Simon Peter. This story is about Jesus. Do you remember our theme verse in this study, John 20 and verse 31? John says, man, I could have told you a lot of stuff that Jesus taught, a lot of the stuff that Jesus did, a lot of the miracles that he worked, but I've had to limit it. And these have been written. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. My point is simply this. If we'll investigate these verses fresh and new, we'll see that they are really about Jesus. What can we learn about Jesus from this infamous encounter with Simon Peter? For that we return to John chapter 13. And I want you to notice in verse 38 the Savior's perception. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? (laughs) Truly, truly, verily, verily. I'm telling you a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Just as Jesus prophesied that one of his apostles would forsake him, he now predicts that another would fail him. And it is a picture of a couple of glorious truths. First, it's a reminder of the deity of Christ. That he is indeed God come in the flesh. He is, in fact, the Christ, the Son of God. Only deity can understand everything that's going to happen before it happens. But there's a more glorious picture and gracious picture perhaps even than that. Because it's a reminder that that Jesus chose Simon Peter knowing full well what a mess he was going to be. I'll never forget the man who asked me about his salvation. He was lost. I was sharing the gospel with him. He said, you mean to tell me that Jesus would die for me and love me and save me after everything I've done? I said, sir, the news is actually better than that. Jesus died on the cross for you, extended his forgiveness to you, before you did all that stuff that you have done, knew that you were going to do it and died in your place anyway and sent me here to tell you that he loves you and he will save you. Sometimes we get the idea that when Jesus goes around collecting souls for the Father's kingdom, that he wants to shop at a museum or purchase some flawless antiques. But in my estimation, Jesus probably shops, spiritually speaking, at the Big Z yard sale. He seems to prefer those that are broken. And that's good news because that's each of us. The good shepherd seems to have his eye on the wounded and the lame, the lost and undone, the useless and the wasted. As best as I can tell, he actually seems to prefer those that are dead. You say, preacher, why? Why do you get so animated? Why do you get so happy? It's because like King David in Psalm 40, 
One day I cried to the Lord and he heard my cry and he lifted me up, not out of a museum or out of a curio cabinet. He lifted me up out of the muck and the mire of my sin and set my feet upon a rock, gave me a firm place to stand, put a song of praise in my mouth, a hymn of praise to my God. I've come today to tell you, you haven't gone too far. That Christ won't restore you. That Christ won't redeem you. He knew you were going to do that before he saved you in the first place. The Savior's perception. Backing up now to verse 36. We read about the Savior's promise. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus said, where I go, you cannot follow me now. But you will follow later. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen with Simon Peter, and he sovereignly proclaims that here. But I want to point out that his prediction is not only about Simon Peter's rejection, but also about Simon Peter's restoration. Simon, I know you're going to blow it, son. I knew that before I saved you. But I want you to understand something, son. After you blow it, I'm not done with you got big plans for you son in fact one day I'm going to put you in the father's trophy cabinet in heaven as a testament of my grace you see look what I did with him look what I did with her Messed up and mixed up and screwed up as they were. As much as they fell. As much as they blew it. As much as they sinned. As much as they faltered. Look how glorious I am because of what I can do even with some messed up junk like that. Luke gives us some insight into this promise in chapter 22. Simon, Simon, behold Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. By the way... If you want a good prayer partner, you've got one. Jesus is praying for you. (laughs) Simon, I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus is telling him before he even falls, I'm going to restore you. May I remind you, this Simon who's got the spotlight in this text because he blew it. In just a few weeks from this passage... He's going to stand in the city of Jerusalem and he's going to preach the gospel of the risen Christ and 3,000 people are going to get saved. When you come to Acts chapter 3, he and John are making their way into the temple and there by the beautiful gate is a man, can you see him with a little beggar's cup? Alms for the poor, alms for the poor. And this one time failure said, I don't have any silver, I don't have any gold, but I've got something better than that. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise and walk. And the man began running and leaping and praising God throughout all of the temple. Turn the city on its ear. Got the attention of the religious leaders. I'm talking about the same crowd that was trying Jesus that night. Simon Peter was shaking in his boots over them. Now, after the resurrection of Jesus and the restoration of Simon, they bring Simon Peter in before that crowd and they say, We want to know, what are you doing preaching about a man named Jesus? And Simon Peter said, Elders, leaders, Let you and all of Israel know, if you want to know by what name and what authority this good deed was done to this man, let it be known what we did. We did in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God has raised from the dead. And don't mistake this, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I've come today simply to tell you that God is not finished with you. You know me well enough to know I'm not minimizing sin, but I come to tell you you hadn't drunk enough beer, popped enough pills, snorted enough stuff up your nose, shot enough stuff up in your veins. You hadn't slept with enough immoral people. You hadn't lied enough, cheated enough, stolen enough that God won't forgive you and use you for His glory. And He'll do it to glorify Himself. You say, I'm such an awful sinner. That just means he is going to be glorified as that much greater of a Savior. The Savior's perception. 
The Savior's promise. And then there's the Savior's person. I want to close with chapter 14 and verse 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Keep in mind there were no chapter and verse divisions in the original text. And so, uh, chapter 14 verse 1 certainly fits with the following verses of chapter 14. But it also serves as a great transition and a capstone to the Lord's encounter with Simon Peter. Simon, I've just told you you're going to blow it. But Simon, don't worry. You believe in God? You can also believe in me. You see, friend, Jesus wants you to know this morning that the remedy for spiritual failure is not trying harder. The remedy for backsliding is not doing better. The remedy for drifting from the Lord is not pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps and giving it one more go for the team. The remedy for failure is Jesus. The remedy for falling is Jesus. The remedy for backsliding and straying from God is the risen Christ himself. He sent me today to tell his people, don't fret Don't worry. Don't look at the mess of your life. Look at the perfection of mine. You believe in God. You can believe in me. I told you I started to call this message. Failure isn't final. Because I believe Jesus delights when his wayward children come home to him. Because when a child of God gets right with the God of that child. It speaks not of the wisdom of that child to come home. It speaks of the glory of God to receive him. Today, the remedy for whatever ails you is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I've done my best to proclaim your word. Oh, how I need it in my life. I suspect I'm not alone. I pray you would glorify Christ in this time of commitment and in every decision that is made, every application that flows from this service. Glorify your Holy Son, Jesus, in these moments. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.